Okay, guys, well, look, I'll, I'll probably start now anyway. Um, like I said, oh, our exhibit was there sort of coming in. But, uh, but thanks for all uh, joining Mobile London. Um, appreciate, obviously, support for all this time. Um, this event will be recorded. Uh, and like I mentioned a moment ago, it'll be put on YouTube. So if anyone is interested in sharing this with friends um, or colleagues who would be interested in the topic, feel free to do so. Um, as you guys know, Oliver Bernard, we, we are a recruitment company, but uh, we, we are looking to keep our mobile community connected throughout this time. We appreciate it's hard for everyone at the moment. Um, we hope everyone's obviously well. Um, as, you, as a lot of you do know, we did host a number of mobile Londons on site. And um, yeah, we're, we're looking to continue to do this remotely until things sort of get back to normal. So um, yeah, we, we do have a number of talks lined up over the next few weeks. Obviously, we've got Rob today, but we, we've got uh, various different topics coming up. So stay in touch for those and uh, feel free to obviously join. Um, or on the recruitment side of things, if anyone has been affected at the moment and is looking for a uh, new role, uh, feel free to obviously reach out after the talk. Uh, you've got me on LinkedIn or email. Um, I'll put that in the group. Just feel free to drop me a message and hopefully, uh, yeah, we'll be able to help. Um, yeah, like I mentioned, uh, it is a tough time for everyone at the moment. Um, I don't know if you did notice, but we do have a uh, Just Giving page for the National Emergencies Trust um, that, that's set up on the meetup. If anyone is able to donate anything, that's obviously very appreciated. Um, it, it's linked with uh, the partnership with the Red Cross and uh, supporting a number of local charities. And it's sort of dished up between the, these guys and helping, obviously, the vulnerable at this time. But, yeah, as I mentioned, I'll, I'll probably pass this over to Rob now. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll let him take over. Um, and yeah, can we leave questions till the end? And um, yeah, over to, over to you, Rob. Cool. Thank you very much. Let me just turn my video on. Awesome. Okay, cool. Um, so hopefully you guys can hear me okay. If you can't, um, let me know in the chat. Um, so yeah, I was saying to Tommy before, it's pretty weird giving a presentation to people when you can't see or hear anyone. Um, so I'll try and keep the, the bad jokes to a minimum. Um, so I'm just going to share my screen and then we can we can get started. Here we go. Cool. I'm going to assume everyone can see that. Um, again, if you can't, just give me a shout in the chat and I'll uh, try and get things sorted. Um, all right, cool. So the name of the talk is to what you do after you publish. So um, I'm going to give a bit of background about myself. So um, I'm an... Uh, let me start again. So this is the talk. Um, and what we're going to try and get through is how to get better ratings, better in-app purchases, press for your apps, and then a few other bits and pieces that I think people could find useful. Um, so a bit of background about me. Um, so I'm an Android developer. Um, I've been doing Android development now for the past uh, nine years. Um, so since 2011, my first um, app was in 2011 um, called Ready to Me. It's still around today um, on the App Store. And um, since then, that was 2011, 2013, I quit my job um, doing web support and other technical support to do um, Android development full time. And I've been doing that ever since. So that's seven years now, which is quite a while. Um, and in that time, I've released um, my own apps. So I think I've got about, I've released 20, over 20 apps on the App Store. I think there's about five or six still up there because um, we're talking about nine years worth of apps. So some of them get maintained, some of them drop off. Um, so I think there's about five still up there. Um, and out of the ones that I've still got, I currently have 50,000 active users. Um, so that's not bragging, that's just a bit of, of background so that um, the stuff that I'm going to talk about in this talk is stuff that I've actually done and it's shown me results. Um, so this is the apps that I've done. And then in the meantime, I've worked for um, freelance work and contractors for all sorts of different companies. So corporate companies, um, I've worked for startups, um, I've worked for appreneurs, um, I've worked for uh, like solo founders, you name it, I've done it. Um, and so just in terms of some of the press that I've got, so the bottom one you're looking at, 2012, that was the second app I ever released. Um, this is before I was doing it professionally. Um, then you've got one from BBC News that they feature one of my apps in a little interview with me in 2017. Um, this is 2018, a different app that I released in that year. And then um, this is 2019, and this is actually the end of the art last year, and they featured my app in this article, and it was the first app that I ever wrote. That is the only, well, not the only one, one of the only ones that I still maintain. Um, so it goes to show that if you, if you do things right, you, you can still um, keep things ticking over. Um, so build it and they will come. Um, I'm not sure how many people have heard this phrase. Um, when the startup culture initially 
um, started, it was it was pretty common. You know, you've got a great idea, just build it, and people want it, and they'll come and they'll find you, and all of this kind of stuff. Um, I've built apps before, um, and they did not come. Nobody came. Um, and the reason that nobody came is because nobody knew that those apps were there or that they existed. So the first thing that I want to get into is finding your audience and getting press. Um, so ideally, you want to find your audience before you start your app development or during your app development. You don't want to build an app, get to the end, and then try and find your users. Um, but let's say you've done some of that, and now you've got to the end, and now you're ready to find your real users who are actually going to use your app and who may be going to make you some money or get you some press or um, whatever it is that you're looking for your app to do. Um, so one of the places that I find really useful to um, find users are in online communities. Um, so they, these could be all sorts of places. So I've done Android apps because um, I'm an Android app developer. So one of the places that I find my users and have found since I started um, for my own apps is XDA, which is an Android development um, forum. It's pretty tech-based. Um, so I should probably say that a lot of the apps that I've done are all are mostly um, uh, utility apps. So you know they perform a specific feature. So for example, one of the apps I have, which is probably my best performing app, reads messages to you on your headphones or in Bluetooth or when you're driving, it will read your WhatsApp message or let you reply with your voice. Um, so those are the kind of apps that I build. So these are, this is the kind of community where I find apps, but other places that, that I find users. But other places that you could find users would be, for example, on Reddit. Reddit is a great place to find users because everyone, every topic you can think of is on Reddit. You know, if you want to build the new Smurfs app, you're going to find people in the Smurf forum on Reddit that are super into that. If you want to build, um, I don't know, I should have come up with better examples before, but if you want to build anything that you want to build, there is a community for you on Reddit. You want to build the new Lord of the Rings fan fiction app. You know, you, there's a Lord of the Rings forum that people are going to love reading that stuff. Um, so you can go on there, you can post, Hey, you know, this is what I've got. See if people want it. See if, see if there's any feedback. Ideally you want to be in the community already. So, you want to be a Reddit user, and if you're not, and you want to start using it heavily, you should probably get in there first. Subscribe to topic, topics that you like, so that when people look at your profile, you're not just shilling for your app, and you're actually a user who happens to also have an app. Um, another great place is Facebook groups. Um, Facebook is the same as Reddit in terms of there's people that are, have got groups for everything. So any app you can think of, you know, you're trying to build a travel app, find the travel community. You're trying to build you know, a London travel app, find the London travel groups and go in there and post, you know, these, these are the apps that, um, these are the, this is the app that I'm building and see if there's any users in there for you. Um, so you want to be active. You want to reply to comments because you want to start a dialogue with these people that could be your users to find out what they actually want. So you can build what they want, um, listen to the feedback and provide them with support for your app as best as you can. Um, and then that leads me on to getting press. So you've built this great app. You don't have any users. You need to go and find your users because you need to tell people that this app is here. People won't just come and find it. So you've done that, and now you want to get the word out to a bigger audience. Um, so a great way to do that is using news websites and other online publications to put the word out for you in your niche so they can target users that you might not be able to target directly. Um, and some of the places for that would be like, for example, The Guardian. I'm an Android developer, like I said. So Android Police is a great website for me. Um, BBC News, if you've got an iPhone and you're building iPhone apps, um, iMore is a great one. Um, Lifehacker, if you've heard of that. All of these places, they, they rank. So like I would rank them as, you know, The Guardian and BBC News are the top tier of press and Android and iMore and Lifehacker are the lower tier of press. Not in that they release bad things, but in terms of um, the size of the audience. You know, if you are somebody, if they heard of BBC, they're going to be, yeah, yes. Have you heard of Lifehacker? It's a very niche audience. But the thing between all of them is they're not hard to get press if you go about it the right way. So the way that I got press um, when I had uh, one of my articles, one of my apps features in The Guardian was I literally went on Twitter, found one of The Guardian reporters that writes about technology, and I messaged him because he had a roundup of you know, the five best apps of the week. And I was just like, hey, have you seen my app? And it ended up that he'd actually already seen it and he'd featured it and I just missed it. But things like that, people are really accessible. So you need to go and you need to ask. Um, also, you want to use, a lot of these websites have a email address on them for tips at 
andropolice.com tips at lifehacker.com you just want to email them and be like hey i've just released this app this is what it does and then if they're interested they'll write about it and if they're not they won't but you know you, it doesn't hurt to try um and also a good way to go about that is to go through the website and find people that write about your topic so you know if you're going on the guardian you want to find the person that writes about travel or fashion or whatever it is that your app does so that you can get in front of them as opposed to going on BBC news and finding the current war reporter and then sending them your travel app and being like, Hey, if, do you know anyone that wants to do a review on this? Um, and there's also really obscure places that you wouldn't think of. So for example, I've had one of my apps featured on a podcast um, that I didn't, I didn't message these people. I don't know who they are. They didn't contact me. I found out because I got a Google alert for my app from their podcast show notes page that they had talked about it for a couple of minutes. And that got me a bunch of downloads. Um, and that might be somewhere that you wouldn't think of, but you know, if like, if you have a travel app, find some travel bloggers, message them, maybe they'll shout your app out. Maybe they'll say they've used it. You know, maybe you just tweet them and they'll just retweet your app. But these are all ways to get in front of an audience that you might not usually. And then in terms of like technology based, there's websites like Lifewire, there's everyone's doing YouTube reviews and all sorts of things, you know, hardware, cameras, computers, cars, you know, I'm sure there's people doing reviews on the latest version of the Zoom app right now. Um, and you could email all of these people, also super accessible, and find the person that's doing the top five, you know, cooking apps of the week and message them and be like, I've just released a cooking app. Um, would you be interested in reviewing it? And make use of is another obscure place that you can find good users. Um, and then the second part is you've got a user base. Now you want to make sure that you can avoid negative reviews because if you're a, if you're a, um, an ind independent app developer, or you're a small startup that doesn't have a lot of funding, or you're a solo um, app entrepreneur, if you release your app today and you get 50 one-star reviews, even if you get 50 five-star reviews to go with it, you're now a three-star app. And climbing it out of that, that um, box of having low reviews and trying to fend off the negative ones so that you can get more high ranking ones so that you can keep climbing back out of that hole. It's really hard. So you want to start off on a good foot and you want to avoid as many negative reviews as you can. And so um, just to put it into context is how many one, two or three star apps are on your device right now. If you're thinking that, you know, you really need a recipe app and you go to the app store right now and you type in recipe app and there's a five star one and there's a four star one and there's a three and a two and a one star app nobody probably on this call is going to look at that and be like, Oh, this one star app looks really good. I'm going to give that a go. They are just not going to take a look period. Um, so one of the first things that I would say from my own experience is just because you know how your app works doesn't mean that your user does. You've built this beautiful app and it does all these cool things. And you know, if I swipe left here and then I swipe right here, it's going to do this, but the user doesn't know that. So the first thing that you want to do in order to avoid as many negative reviews as you can is you want to make everything stupidly obvious. So easy ways to do this would be onboarding screens. I install your app. The first thing it does is it shows me, you know, some of the features of the app, not how to use them or how to turn them on, just that this app does this thing. And then you swipe the screen. This app also does this thing. So the user knows that those things are available. And then when they're in the app, maybe I go to this particular screen in the app and the whole screen grays out and a certain portion of the screen is highlighted and a little tool tip comes up and says, you know, press this button to do something. Um, that's a really good way to guide people through your app without um, being intrusive, but also without people feeling lost. Like I'm sure most of, well, I'm sure a lot of us have um, downloaded an app and you turn it on and you get to the home page and you're like, what do I do now? And there's nothing telling you what to do. I press this button, something happened. Why did that happen? I don't understand what happened. So you want to make it as obvious as you can. Um, In-app tutorials is also a great way to do that. Um, if you're a game, for example, maybe you want a tutorial of how to use the game. Or if you're um, Instagram, maybe you want a tutorial of how to make your first post. Um, things that just make it easy for the users to know and giving them less things that they want to complain about. Um, Pop-ups to acknowledge if setting changes. So I write utility apps, which means, you know, I have apps that, have lots of different settings. And sometimes if you turn on this setting, it will turn off this setting. And I learned the hard way that users don't understand that just because, you know, I said you can play music across this channel. Like I, just because I said that you can play music on your headphones does, they don't know that it's also, it, that means it's going to turn off the music on your speaker. They want both. 
So when that happens, they're like, oh, it's broken. Let me leave a bad review. So you have to make it obvious that these are the things that could happen. Um, and the thing to remember throughout the process is the user isn't using your app wrong. If you think to yourself, I've got this complaint about something to do with my app, some feature doesn't work or it does this, but I thought it was going to do this. That's not the user using your app wrong. That's your UX not being good enough or intuitive enough or obvious enough for that user to know this is what was actually supposed to happen. Um, and another thing to remember is if there's no avenue to provide feedback, people will do it in a review. So if I can't email you because I don't have your email address and I have no other way to contact you and I really want to use your app, the only way that I'm going to be able to get in contact with you is if I leave you a review. So I'm going to leave you a one star or a two star review and inside the review, it's not going to be, hey, this app's rubbish, don't download this app. It's literally going to be a comment from me to you as the developer saying, this thing's broken, I thought this thing was going to work, can you please fix it? And I've had lots and lots of reviews like that where they're not negative because they think the app's bad, they're negative because they're trying to get your attention so that you can improve it. And then I have to go back later and email them and be like, hey, I fixed this thing, could you go and update your review? You want to avoid that as best as you can. So you want to give people as many avenues of feedback as you can so that the only time they want to go and leave a review is if it's a positive one. Um, so different ways that you can have feedback channels. So in-app messaging um, is a good one. So there's tools like Intercom. Um, essentially, it does what Facebook Messenger does for websites where there's a button in your app, you press it, pops up with a chat window, they can send you a message directly. Um, and then you can reply to them directly. And also it gives you good um, ways to get information about them. So for Android, for example, and I imagine it's the same for iOS, would be, you know, someone sends me an intercom message. From that intercom message, I can see what device they have. I can see what version of the build they have or which version of the app they have. I can see what features they've got turned off, on and off. It makes it really easy for me or you to provide support. Um, another one is email. Email is a great channel. Everyone still uses it. In my apps, I have all over my apps, I'll have places that will have, say, like a little button that says, do you need help? Another button that says, contact us. Another button that says, request a new feature, report a bug. They all go to the same email um, and they just open up the user's email app and they can send me an email about whatever it is that they've got a problem with. But it's a way for them to get in contact with me rather than going and leaving a negative review. Um, alpha and beta test channel. So on the Play Store for Android, um, iOS gives you an alpha and a beta test channel that users can subscribe to so that you can um, give them pre-release versions of the app that they can then give you feedback on. Um, so if you have an app, app that's on iPhone and it's on Android, then you could still use that channel just to test features, just to get feedback and apply that to both your apps. Um, if you're on iPhone, there's things like TestFlight and there's other ways that you can give users um, pre-release and also it makes them feel good because they'll give you some feedback you'll implement that feedback and then they'll go and tell people hey I'm testing this app and I told so and so this and they changed it exactly how I wanted Facebook groups and Facebook pages are another great way to give feedback <coughs> excuse me um, you can create a Facebook page for your app you can create a Facebook group for your app if you think your user base is big enough and then you can start a dialogue with your users so if I have a problem with your app now why am I going to go to the App Store and leave a review when I can literally go on Facebook and send you a message? Um, you want to reply to re your reviews is the next thing. Um, so if you have on Android and on, on iOS, you have an option to reply to your App Store reviews. So if you want to, I don't know if you guys can see that, but that is my cat's head dangling over the camera. Um, so this is, this is live action. Um, so if you want to, if somebody leaves you a negative review, you can email, you can reply to their review. Hey, send me an email. I can fix it. Or, Hey, I've already fixed this feature. Check out the new build and update your review. There's different ways to avoid the negative ones. And if you can't avoid the negative reviews, you can change them afterwards. If you take on that feedback. Um, the next thing would be replying to support emails and messages. Hold on one second. Really sorry guys. There you go, that's your entertainment for the night. Um, so you want to reply to support emails and messages. So if someone does send you an intercom message or someone does send you a support email, don't just ignore it. You want to reply, hey, thanks for the message. The reason it does this is blah, 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 or we're going to fix this, or this is on the roadmap, or whatever. People want to feel involved and they want to feel like they've been heard so that they don't then go and leave a negative review. Um, so you've, you're trying to avoid negative reviews and then you want to get positive ones. 
And the thing that you have to remember is people are more inclined to leave negative reviews than positive ones. You know, I buy stuff online all the time and I have a really good experience. I don't, I don't go and leave a review for that website. Maybe I should, but I don't. But if I buy stuff online and it comes and it's broken or it never turns up, I might be inclined to go and leave a review on that website because I'm annoyed. So you want, you want to encourage people to leave positive reviews. And the more reviews you get, like we said before, the more the higher your rating, the more users you're going to get. Because now you've gone from being a two-star app to a five-star app, and I'm going to download the five-star app. So how do you get users to leave positive reviews? You ask them. Um, it, sounds, it sounds silly and it sounds simple, but you just want to ask your users, can you leave a review? And there's lots of ways that you can do that. So a good way is timed pop-ups in your app. You've seen them, even Instagram has them. You use Instagram for a little while and it will pop up with a message. Hey, do you like Instagram? Yes. Would you like to leave us a review? Yes or no? Um, the, the idea behind this is you want to time it strategically. I don't want to install your app for the first time. And as soon as I open the home screen, it says, do I want to leave a review? No, I don't. So you want it to be some sort of metric to do with your app. So maybe, you know, a user's played your game 10 times. Now you're going to ask them, do they like, do they like the app? Maybe um, a user's used this specific function 10 times. Maybe a user sent 100 messages in your app and now you're going to ask them, do, you, do they like your app? And the way that you want to ask is not, do I want to leave a review? You want to ask them if they like the app. Because if, if you ask them, do you want to leave a review? Um, and they say yes, but they've got bad feedback, they're going to leave a bad review. If you ask them, do you like the app? And they say no, because they've got bad feedback. Now you can say, oh, I'm really sorry to hear that. Would you like to send us a message? Maybe they do, maybe they don't, but you're avoiding them going to the app store and leaving a bad review. If they say yes, they do like the app, now you can say, would you like to leave us a rating? Um, and you want to use searchable metrics to determine how likely it is that they're going to leave a positive review. So, you know, it's all well and good if they've sent 100 messages, but then if your analytics say that their app crashed 100 times, maybe that's not the time to ask them, do they want to leave a good review? Um, the next thing to get into is how do you improve your in-app purchases? Um, so there's there's two models of, of apps of, that earn money, which is freemium and premium. And then there's some in between, but these are the two key ones. So you've got premium, which is primarily a paid app um, and freemium, which is, it's a free app, but with paid features. Um, and I've done both. Um, and I can tell you from an independent developer's point of view, you want in-app purchases versus paid, well, you can do both, but I would say in-app purchases work better than paid apps because in-app lets the user use your app for longer and then pay for the features that they want as opposed to time limiting them or limiting them completely, which is they have to give you money to find out what they're getting. Um, so the way that I would go about it is free and paid features. So all of my apps that I paid had free and paid features. So you get the app, you can use it for free. And I also give trials of the features that are paid for a specific period of time. So let's say two weeks. So now you get to use the entire app for two weeks. And in two weeks time, you just get the free version of the app and you can pay if you want to continue using the paid features. But by this point in time, you've been using it for two weeks. So if you want the paid features, you're gonna pay for them because you've already got used to using them. And if you don't, then you're not. Um, so, and then the other ways that you can push for more is um, push, me push messaging is a great one. So, you know, the users had your app for six months. They're on the free version. They haven't paid for the paid features. You can send them a push message saying, hey, you know, today it's 50% off. So maybe they'll, they'll buy it because it's 50% off. Maybe they won't. Maybe you send them a push message which actually turns on a trial. So you're like, hey, you've been using this app for six months. Here's two week trial, another two week trial of these paid features. So they get another two weeks if they want to spend the money. I do promotions on my apps for all kinds of different holidays. And again, it has to be strategic. So, you know, if, if you've just sent someone a promotion saying happy Thanksgiving, here's 50% off, maybe don't send them one saying, you know, Merry Christmas because it's only been a week and now they just get notifications on their phone. So maybe have some sort of logic that says, you know, if you've received one within the last six months, you're not going to get another one. But they're really good ways to pull in revenue. And I'll see if if a hundred pounds is my regular income from an app every month, then sending one of these Merry Christmas messages is 50% off. That would literally double their income for the month at least. And then another good one, which a lot of people don't think of is promo codes. Like on websites, you have promo codes. 
you know, you enter this code and you get 20% off. On apps, you can do the same thing. Even when the, the Play Store and the App Store don't give you great options to do promo codes, you can just implement that kind of stuff to sell. And if you're not a developer, you can ask your developers to do it. And it's very, very straightforward and very, very underutilized. I would also say if you are an independent developer, um, go in for the paid option. If it's possible, I would go for the subscription model because so I've had an app out since 2011. It's still out now. It has paid features. The first five years of that app's life maybe was paid one time payment. You get to use the app for life. Um, and I wanted to move to subscription model because I want the recurring revenue um, because otherwise I'm maintaining an app that people have paid for once but the money is not paying for me to now maintain it because it's taking me longer than I'm more time than it's worth that I'm earning. Um, and so I switched it to a subscription model and I was really nervous. Like, Oh my God, people are going to be um, complaining. My, my rating is going to go down. Um, and nobody cared because all the people that were buying it were none the wiser. And they obviously weren't bothered that rather than a one pound purchase one time, it's now one pound a year to use this app. So I'd also advocate for the subscription model if you can. Um, and then a couple of honorable mentions about ways to, to improve your app ratings and um, to get more in-app purchases and just to push your app out there. Um, so one of them is Firebase predictions. Um, so Firebase is a tool that um, was bought by Google. It's a whole suite of things. Um, it's Firebase analytics, it's hosting, it's all kinds of things. One of the tools they had um, is called Firebase predictions, which basically if you use Firebase analytics inside your app, um, Firebase, which is basically Google, uses machine learning to tell you which users they think are more likely to spend in your app based on other users spending in your app. So then you can send targeted push messages to those users or targeted in-app messages, depends on what format your app is, to um, get them to play more. You know, maybe if, if Google, if, if the prediction says, these 50% of users are more likely to buy, you can send them an extra two week trial because they're more likely to purchase the full version at the end of it. I would also say on this note, it also um, tells you a prediction of who's more likely to churn. So then you can try and engage those users to stop them from leaving your app. Um, and then another one that I like is remote config, which is also a Firebase tool, which is basically just lets you do A-B testing. So you know, you've got all these nice tutorials in your app, you've got your review pop up asking, you've got your copy saying, you know, hey, 50% off for Christmas. Um, and remote config would let you A-B test different copies. So sometimes, I, so maybe you test 50-50 against your entire audience. Um, they get a review pop up that says, hey, would you like to leave a review? And then the other 50% gets a review pop up saying, would you like to give us a five star rating? And then you can see which one performs better and then you can go with that one. So it would improve your overall reviews because the copy is more likely to engage users. Um, and that's basically the talk. It's pretty simple, kind of simple. Go find your audience. You need to make sure you can control the feedback loop as best as you can. And then you make the money. Um, and that's, that's it from me. I'm going to hand it back to Tommy. Um, if you guys have got questions, I think Tommy's going to go through this, but as I'm saying, it, oh, no, he's right here. Um, so just before I finish, I was going to say, if you want to get in touch with me, the best way to do it is LinkedIn. Um, I made it really easy. So you guys can go to bobj.me slash LinkedIn. Um, my website's robj.me if you want to see any of the work that I've done. And um, my email address is there if you guys want to get in contact with me directly. And I'm going to stop sharing now. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah, cheers, Rob, for that. Um, yeah, um, if anyone does have any um, questions, if you want to put that now in the chat bar, um, I'm sure Rob will be happy to answer those for us. Um, yeah, if you want to put down there, I think Ricardo's up. Message one second. Yeah, yeah I, I think they're yet yeah, questions coming up. Yeah. Yeah, I can see one from Ricardo. Um, so. Oh, they're all popping up now. All right, cool. Um, so the first one, does it apply to iOS apps? Um, everything's the same. The only difference is the test channels are different. On Android, it's a lot easier to create groups of alpha and beta users, and I can literally paste the link to join on my website. Um, on iPhone, it's a little bit more involved. But aside from that, everything else is the same. Um, the way that you go about things are the same. Even the tools that I mentioned are the same. They're both available for iOS. Um, and then... Awesome, no worries. Um, and then James Pearson has got a question. Um, do paid reviews work and would you recommend them? 
Um, so I would say I don't know because I've never used them. And based on that, I would not recommend them. And the only reason why is that you could easily pay someone to review, but unless you're paying like someone from the BBC or someone from the Guardian, you could just as easily go on YouTube, find the top 10 list of app reviewers, message all of them and say, hey, would you like um, a review? Would you like to review my app? I've just released it. Um, and if you message 10 of them, at least five of them are gonna say yes, because they're trying to produce content, your content, and if your app is good, you're gonna get features well on those placements. I've done quite a few like YouTube reviews, um, or I've had my apps re reviewed by quite a few YouTube reviewers. Um, and, one, and some of them, for example, XDA, which only does Android apps, but they'll do a whole video on your app if they think it's good, and all you have to do is ask. Um, so if you have the money and you wanna pay for it, then that's great, but I wouldn't go that route. Um, can I share the slides afterwards? Yes, I can. Um, if so, I'll, I'll, I'll set them up. So if you go to, um, robj.me, which is my website forward slash slides, I'll, I'll put them on there. Um, give it like 20 minutes after this talk, it'll be there. Otherwise you can pay me on LinkedIn and I'll send it to you direct. Um, another question, do you spend money on Facebook ads to promote your apps? Um, no, I actually, I actually don't. Um, and that's just something I haven't done. I would definitely... Um, recommend going that route because I've spent money on Facebook ads for other um, things that are not app related but I try and go the organic route and also because my I have a full-time job doing app development um, as a contractor and a freelancer and then the apps that I do on my own on my side hustle let's say so I'm less worried about them getting a million downloads as much as I am I just find it super cool that people are using my apps um, and then I make my money building apps for other people um, but if, if you're a startup, for example, definitely Facebook ads would be a great way to go or Instagram ads or even LinkedIn ads. Uh, another question. How big a group would you test your app on before releasing to the public? Um, as big as you can, um, I would go. So I had an app that came out, I think it was 2013. Um, and I had 40,000 test users before the app was released. Um, which was by accident. I posted it, not by accident, but it was a bit of a fluke. I posted it on a forum um, and I was like, hey, I'm building this app. Is anybody interested? Turns out a lot of people were interested. Um, and the amount of feedback that you get from that is really useful because then when you get the rankings, they're like, oh, this, this app is now top for today. Um, so, you know, maybe we want to write about that. And then you also have to remember if you can get featured on a website, they all write what everyone else is writing. So if you get featured on iPhone website A, iPhone website B is going to see that and they're going to be like, I'm going to write about this app. And then iPhone website C is going to, and it just, it's just like a cascade. Um, next question. Uh, where are we? I think um, we're on different wait think wait list. Do you think wait lists are a good idea? Um, oh, that's a great question. Um, I think I think it depends. So there was an app that came out a while ago. I think it was called Mailbox. I might be wrong. It was an email app made by Dropbox on iPhone and all the review websites were going crazy about it. And I think the great thing about that was they had a wait list. But if I was on, my, if I was on the wait list today, I'd be in the app tomorrow. If I'm on the wait list today and I'm not in the app, tomorrow then why do i have this app on the phone it would have to be something that someone really really wants so i would suggest trying to not go that route um like you can go that route if you have a really small user base or if you're not sure that your infrastructure is going to be able to take the flood of users that you expect but then my advice would be try and get them in as quickly as you can because the longer they're there the more they get frustrated or just they just uninstall the app and they don't come back um, I think that's it for the question. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, it looks like, welcome. It looks like, yeah, it looks like that's it for the moment. Um, obviously, yeah, thanks cool. again, Rob. Um, yeah, really interesting talk. Thanks nice. for kicking off the first uh, remote mobile London for us. Um, as I mentioned at the start, um, thanks for everyone else for coming. Um, I hope you're all staying well and safe. Um, we, we have got a number of host um, well talks lined up over the next few weeks, so obviously stay in touch for the notifications on those. Um, be, be keen to see everyone there as well. Um, but yeah, I think that's it. Or is that one last question that sort of popped up? Um, 
is that one last thing that's one last question Rob. so yeah the last question is uh does having your own apps help you in your work as a contractor freelancer is it easier for you um so yes definitely having your own apps look makes you look like a pretty good prospect because people can actually go and see the work that you did um aside from does it make it easier for you i think when you're starting out when i started out i did it as a hobby so the fact that i had my own apps made it easier for me to get a job doing this without trying to get a job and having no experience um but then i think once you have a bit of experience if you know what you're doing then it, it's about the same so if you're already in in the industry i don't think you have to go out and build apps just to build a portfolio no no okay well look i'm perfect if that's it guys that, thanks for everyone for coming again um yeah Cheers, Rob. And uh, yeah, we'll, we'll stay in touch. Everyone stay safe. And uh, yeah, hope to see you all at the next event. Cheers again. Cheers. Thanks, Rob.